Welcome to the Medical Insider Podcast, where we highlight real life solutions to your health challenges, incorporate new technology and proven solutions from the past with a healthy dose of common sense while resisting the pitfalls of idiopathic classifications and economically based medical doctrine. This is your host, Dr. Thomas Santucci. Let's get started. So most of us out there think our brains work pretty well. Um, a lot of times, especially if you know, you're know you successful, you've lived a reasonably long life, you got through the 60s, you know, you're here, um, you're doing pretty well. But for, for consistent performers, which is kind of a nice word I made up for people who don't think they have problems, is that it, it always can improve your memory, it can improve your, your cognitive performance, and it can decrease your stress. When we're looking at problems, when we're looking at real you know, mental dysfunction, um, neurofeedback is particularly effective in attention deficit because it changes that perseverance problem hyperactivity, perseverance. And then in most people, there is a level of healthy anxiety, but some people take it too far. This can measure and correct that. Um, I was surprised how effective neurofeedback was for very, very serious addictions. We um, About eight years ago, we had a couple of patients with serious narcotic problems, and we went through, you know, a whole functional medicine workup is as sophisticated it was in those days. It's certainly gotten better. But it was relatively easy to to take that person through the 20 days and to get them on the other side of an addiction problem. We're not seeing quite so much of it, but you know, I'd still say, you know, we've got less in the functional alcoholic world as as we have more like food addictions and really lifestyle stimulation addiction problems. So I think things are a little more subtle and what is being presented, not so, you know, emergency room medical-ish, but it still exists. And so one of the things that um, the brain scan will show you is kind of what's your quotient and that kind of stuff. So some more science. Um, when we're assessing the effectiveness of neurofeedback um, in general, is that neurofeedback keeps getting to the top of the list, and I'm talking about overdrug therapy. So when we're talking about like in training specific areas of the brain, which is the the low beta beta training uh, in the neurofeedback uh, actual sessions, we're improving it more than any other modality, and that's a PubMed um, uh, publication. Um, one of the things when I was doing the uh, um, developmental delay work, um, the postdoctorate childhood development work, um, it was it was fascinating to me that neurofeedback works as well as any drug. And this is the ch the children's AMA saying this, and so it's basically saying you know Speed or Adderall was not as effective as neurofeedback was as a as a total program. When you look at the um, acceptance of it or the, the actual usage of it, neurofeedback is only done in about 5% of those cases. And this is a shame because this is one of those areas that people are spending in the day, I they used to know the numbers, but they were, the average um, person, you know, family with a developmental delay, someone on the spectrum, child, they used to spend about $17,000 a year with very little upside. Neurofeedback almost always makes improvements in that group. And I always wondered, you know, we had done this for about eight years, and then we went on to um, stem cells, and then we went on to the genetic analysis and kind of combining complex cases. But I always wondered why the psychologists and the psychiatrists didn't use this, why it wasn't easy to refer to somebody who would like do a brain scan, do neurofeedback, and take care of what that could be taken care of. In this area, which we're in a, a meta society of about 2 million people around the, the San Jose area, there's about five neurofeedback practitioners. There needs to be about 500. And it's amazing to me how primary care hasn't done anything to get the analysis right and to get interventions right in neurology that goes beyond Neurontin and you know pituitary tumors. So it's kind of a profession that has not picked up on the technology. 
And so one of the things that happens is when you go to try to understand and people try to do their own research on it, it's just like stem cells. It's just like genetic testing. It's about 20 to one on the internet against this. And I'm looking at it and going, you know, how are people getting this, this wrong? You know, we did hundreds and hundreds of brain scans and neurofeedback sessions. And, you know, with, you know, this thing has like a 90% success rate in moving the ball forward and really providing individuals with lots of understanding of their condition. So a good thing happened after COVID or with COVID was the technical capability to provide neurofeedback sessions at home flourished. So it was a good thing and a bad thing because basically there was really the capability in these pretty complex systems to do what we used to do in the clinic at home. So that's like the single channel neurofeedback. We're doing multi-channel neurofeedback, which means we can entrain twice as many areas in the same amount of time. It's, it's really amazing. Now at home, th there is what we used to have in the clinic, these one-channel neurofeedback systems based on brain scans. But also, there's a ton of other technologies that are very, very, very simple. And they're probably better than doing nothing, but you know, something that only entrains one of the delta, theta, alpha, beta wave series. So it only does, let's say, theta waves and to help you with sleep, let's say. That's probably fine, but it's not anywhere near what the real capability to do at home. So the problem with it is, and again, I looked at 17 different systems in preparing this talk. I can't even figure out what those things do. And so what, what happened is we bought a couple of them and saw, saw if they did anything, and none of them did anything close to what a single channel neurofeedback system will do. So what I think, you know, for remote people, a very, very viable kind of a recipe would be get a brain scan, you know, get a, a multi-channel brain scan, figure out, that's like testing 19 points in your in your brain all at once figure out what the frequencies are that you need for a treatment, and then you can either go to the practitioner's office, which is the most effective because it's it's multi-channel treatment, or get a brain scan or a, or a feedback unit that you do at home. We have patients that are coming from three or four hours away. You know, they have special needs kids. That's the, the algorithm we would do. For other people, it's just their time is so precious and they're not worried about hooking up two diodes to their head, they should do the home unit. But this is really something that has changed. Um, you know, th This was never available even five years ago. I want to briefly go into the patient experience. Again, we have a clinic that, that specializes in chronic acute cases, so we never just do one thing. Um, but these cases really highlight the importance and the power of doing a brain scan and neurofeedback. So this patient had a medically induced coma after a severe car accident. I have a soft spot in my whole life for car accidents because I was in 20 of them and it changed almost everything about me. So he presented with complete low affect, lethargy, nominal aphasia, which means he couldn't remember words, depression, significant body. So he basically came in and he was like, I have this high powered Silicon Valley job. You know, should I just forget it and wash windows for a living or, you know, can my brain be fixed? Um, the great thing about this guy is that he was sort of an athletic trainer type. He was, he understood doing things in a methodical and a consistent way, repetitions that created myelination. One of the things that happened, he was a communicator and he stuttered and his indecisiveness made him completely ineffective in his company so that he took three months off and actually just devoted himself to, to our care. So we did 40 sessions of frontal lobe neurofeedback. We supported the neurotransmitters, threonine and serotonin. We did the vestibular rehab. Vestibular rehab is exercises that myelinate pathways. So we used every gadget that we have. We have $400,000 worth of the equipment in our clinic, so he used almost all of it. He did his home exercises and then his memory exercises. At three months, speech was improved, stuttering and ability to handle questions was improved, reading accuracy was improved. At six months, he came in and he says, my kids no longer think I'm an idiot. 
that was definitely the win. So pain was at zero, he's resumed working. So that's like a restoration of like so many things that were adding up to a syndrome that would be considered incurable on the neuropsychological side. So we began to really view the brain as the delimiter. And like more than anything else, your attitude, but based on your capability, is determining your reality. So the only limit really is your mind. This was our first official Alzheimer's patient. This person had significant memory problems, and um, we've treated a few Alzheimer's patients since then. And I know it's kind of interesting. We're treating an older Asian woman, and she's very proper, and she's very friendly, and she laughs at everything, and she doesn't remember anything, but she's really pleasant to be around. This person wasn't. Um, she was probably, and I said it here, the best framer of insults I've ever met. She was probably one of the meanest people that I've ever met. Um, she had problems with caretakers. She was wearing out her family support. She was grandiose with paranoia. She felt like she was in a reality that was being manipulated and concerned whether she was in the right version of, of space-time. It was interesting. Um, when you talked to her, she would like meet out the insults. It was, just, it was like owning a shark. It was amazing. We went after the temporal lobe. The temporal lobe is kind of the emotional center, you know, the best way to get to the deeper parts of the brain and the frontal lobe. Um, we also detected and chelated lead and arsenic. So it wasn't just that she was a nasty person, it she was poisoned. Um, we did um, neurotransmitter support, and you'll notice it was serotonin and threonine. Um, the patient refused to exercise. She actually refused to do anything that we didn't do for her. It's interesting to me, like when we're talking about these, you know, specialized neurocognitive diseases, like they don't affect, you know, us or our loved one. When I actually did the research, hippocampal degeneration, the memory center of the brain, is almost universal, but the hippocampus can regenerate itself. And this is a great example of that. Um, so one of the things that this patient used to do, and she did it at three months, is she didn't recognize the clinic, who I was or why she was coming here. It was pretty amazing to see the level of short-term memory loss that was going on here. Like, you know... Remember, your brain wants to survive, so it's going to remember the first things you learn. It's going to learn how to walk or remember how to walk. It's going to remember how to eat. It's going to remember how to basically dress. But what color your socks are or what you had for breakfast this morning are not part of the survival mechanism. So it's not going to keep those thoughts. So short-term memory is always going to be the first thing to go. One of the things that happens with that is that there's also a neglect surrounding it. So almost nobody knows they have really have a memory problem. The person who knows it is their spouse or their, their close friends. And usually they're too polite to bring it up. So we're always dealing with a problem that the person doesn't know they have. So in this particular case, it was almost like somebody flipped a switch. One day she went from being completely non-aware, anti-empathetic, I mean, she was really, really, really kind of nasty, to where... Um, she saw a picture of my kids and said, did they, did you do that or were they going to turn out that well anyway? And at that point, I, you know, it was like a massive introspective, um, empathetic kind of a statement. She really understood what she was looking at for the first time in probably 10 years. At that point, I introduced myself. I said, hi, I'm Dr. Santucci. We've never met. And then we just went on from then. Um, she's fine now. This is what a plan looked like in the day. So we always are going to look at what the patient walked in with. We're going to look at, you know, any testing we're doing. We're going to look at what the brain scan says. The physical side, you know, like in her particular case, there was pain from an L5 myotome. We're going to fix that stuff. I never really went away from the physical, biochemical, neuro, and energetic model. I just really think that that's the, the essence of all the problems. So that gets into a big statement, in my opinion, that medicine isn't really structured to handle that. We've over-specialized, we do the same treatment in each of the subspecialties, and we don't have anybody who is what I call an informed generalist. And I, I really think that the PCPs, the 
the primary care physicians should be the heroes of medicine. They should be the ones that are kind of running everything and, and directing everything. What we've done is we've made a specialist-driven medical system where the specialists are really making the decisions, but they're not really responsible for the outcomes of the patient. Long-term health is being handled by nobody. So the problem with that, and the, really the opportunity here, is that your long-term health is handled by you. And so what you need is doctors aren't paternalistic doctors anymore. You don't need someone to make your decisions for you that that age is over. But you need someone who is a coach. You need someone who can help you, who can give you tools, who can you know, provide really input and support for rational plans. Right now, in the sick care and the, the really negligent care that, that is produced regularly by our system, you know, all the responsibility for healthcare is really on the patient. So where does neurofeedback fit into health management? So first of all, it's a root cause intervention. So there's a lot of discussion, you know, having done functional medicine for 30 years now, we didn't have clever cliches for it. You know, we, we're kind of like, you know, we're going to understand the underlying cause of the illness and it's, um, you know, it's antecedents, triggers, and modulators. Well, now it's, it's been characterized as root cause medicine. And it's always interesting to me to see a doctor who went to a weekend course and thinks they're a functional medicine doctor. But what root cause medicine actually is, is not just what's etiology, but what are the interrelationships of that? It takes about 10 years to learn functional medicine. I don't, you know, it doesn't matter how smart you are. It's a, it's a whole profession. So because somebody can cut out a pituitary tumor does not mean that they can run a functional medicine um, intervention. So the other thing is basically neurofeedback is the, the window for neocognitive, neurocognitive um, illnesses. So when we're looking at dementias, brain brightening, chronic disease, it's a first place to look. It's a, it's a diagnostic tool that gives us information you can't get anywhere else. Um, the other thing is we have a society that's plagued by neuropsychological issues. I mean, especially after COVID, especially with the complexities of our society, you know, name your, you know, sensitivity to a local, uh, national, or a world problem, but there's plenty to be worried about. So this quantifies levels of anxiety and depression. It gives you sensible strategies. And, and for family members, a lot of times what we're seeing in these complex cases is the caretakers are just overwhelmed. Well, the person who is sick needs the care and the caretaker needs the care. And then kind of my basic message here is this is part of an age management program. This is, you know, part of using regenerative interventions, that's code for stem cells, genomics, which is DNA testing, and then neurofeedback. And I think if a person does that, then they're actually controlling something. Um, we're getting access to this, these billionaire clubs where they're dropping into the uh, pools of ice water every day to like wake up their brain. It's just silly to me, like how far off almost everybody is. So again, one of the big distinctions in, in everything, I think, and certainly in medicine, it's not money, it's not, it's not um, access, it's information. So a person that does a brain scan and neurofeedback simply has way more information about how their system is working and what they can do about it. So. This statement has evolved over time, but I initially said no one has ever met themselves or no one has ever met another person until they do a, a brain scan. And I kind of rewrote it and said no one has ever truly understood the intricacies of another person's mind or their own until they do a brain scan. And so this is an opportunity to kind of figure out how does your car run? What is actually going on with the sub-processes that make you you? you know, your personality, your effectiveness, your interrelationship with reality. So this is one of the things that, you know, we invite you to search out, we invite you to research, and we invite you to take advantage of. Thanks for listening to the Medical Insider Podcast. If you enjoyed today's episode, make sure you visit medicalinsider.com. Go ahead and sign up for these episodes. 
get them sent directly to your inbox. Do us a favor and give us a like.